Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. And away we go. Here we are with episode 14 of the Principles of Performance podcast. I am Eric Degatti, along with my co-host, Mike Perry. Mike sporting his DJ headphones. He may be mixing up some jams (laughs) later on for us. Hey, Um, you're going to, I have, you can't see it because we got the background, but I got a little uh, mixing table on the side, man. We're going to some, we're going to get some lights going before you know it. I forgot my other ones. And uh, this is, this is what we had to go with. But uh, makes my hair look good, and that's what matters. <laughs> DJ Mike on the one and twos today. But more importantly, we have another awesome guest with us today that I'm super excited about, Dr. John Rusin. Uh, John is an internationally recognized strength coach, speaker, and writer who's appeared in Men's Fitness, Men's Health, T Nation, Bodybuilding.com, Stack Magazine, Muscle and Strength. Uh, he's got his PPSC courses, pain free, pain free performance training systems teaches thousands of people all over the world. Uh, He has advanced degrees in exercise science and physical therapy. Uh, He's developed performance regeneration aesthetics programs, some of the best strength, power, and endurance athletes, uh, including MLB All-Stars, NFL All-Pros, Olympic medalists, world record, powerlifters, bodybuilders, figure competitors, uh, uh, all-world Ironman triathletes, and top pros from uh, a bunch of the major sports leagues. Uh, Awesome to see you again, John. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric, Mike. It's always a pleasure uh, conversing with you guys, doing great it, stuff. Yeah, it is. It has been a long time for for you and I, John, since we spoke last. Yeah, I, I want to date myself, but I would say it's uh, going on ten years. Uh, I remember being down in North Carolina, as I remember, and we were talking at a functional movement summit uh, of all places, and that's where we originally met and. I want everyone to know how awesome even 10 years ago, Eric was, uh, you know, I was a nobody, nobody knew my name back then. And I emailed Eric a couple different questions. And instead of emailing me back some bullshit answer, Eric's like, Hey, you have time to jump on a call. And we talked through a couple of the systems that I was running. And I'll never forget that because that's so cool. And that's stuff that you never forget. And you always try to pay forward to everyone else who is maybe approaching you in that same lens later on in your career. So thanks for that, man. I, I never forgot that. No, I appreciate it. And then who knew you'd go on to, to be famous and I'd be the, the, the low man on the pole, you know, and, and you know what, when you see our industry, especially you look at social media, the, I saw that the role of the angry old man who thinks everybody stole everything from him was already taken. Um, so I'll let other guys take that role and uh, just kind of, you know, happily give my time to anybody who will listen. So um, let's just jump right into it. So I got, I got a lot of stuff I want to cover with you, John, because I've seen the work you've been doing and it's been awesome. And I'm so excited to see where you've come in in those years. Um, And with your background, kind of that hybrid, you know, rehab and and as well as the strength and conditioning stuff, tell us kind of how that thought process evolved and what kind of brought you to, you know, what you're doing now. I always loved training, Uh, being an athlete myself. The gym was always the place that I liked most. The playing field was second. Um, It took me a decent way. I played Division I baseball, and I was a pretty good player. I was all right, but I always just loved training. And that had been in me since I picked up a weight at, like, age 13. Um, Looking back on the influences that I had, kind of to get to the point where I wanted to make a career out of this, my mom was a university professor. My father was a university professor. My dad was also an athletic director for 27 schools in the Western New York area. So from the time I could walk, I was in the gymnasium. I was in the weight room. I was on the football field. And it was something that was just normal. You know, on a Wednesday night, you know, we're going to games. I'm five years old. And it was something I just loved to be around. It was the competition. It was the camaraderie. 
but I think it was also the chase to do something epic. It was the chase to do something um, that was not normal. And I always thought it was cool that like people knew my dad. They're like, oh, you know who your dad is? Yeah, he's Dr. Russ. And like, it was, it was a cool thing for me as a kid growing up that way. But all of that led into the two different influences hitting me hard when I got into college. So played baseball in college, but after that exercise science major, and I coached uh, at University of Buffalo right after that. It was a great job. I loved it. I loved being in the weight room, uh, spent some time with basketball, the Olympic sports. And then all of a sudden, I was living at home at the time because I had no money. Uh, as you guys know, you don't really make a whole lot in that position. And living at home with my mom and my dad, I'm 20 something years old. And they're like, I think you should like continue on your education coming from Dr. and Dr. Russin. So I was like, yeah, okay. Uh, what do you what do you think? And my mom had an idea that at her college, Damon College in East Amherst, New York, they had this new program that was called Doctor of Physical Therapy. So she's like, this thing sounds pretty cool. I think this could fit you. And the selling point to me at the time, I had no, I had no idea what physical therapy was, never had been in physical therapy as a patient a day in my life. Sue Falzoni, of all people, was on a billboard on Main Street in front of the campus with her Dodgers hat on. And it was like first female athletic trainer, physical therapist in MLB history. So I drove by the campus. I was like, oh, I really love baseball. I love athletic performance. That lady seems like she's got it figured out. Let's go down that path. Uh, three and a half years later, a lot of education later, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, a lot of studying late nights. Uh, I realized I didn't necessarily want to be on that side of the rehab performance paradigm and decided to go out and start personal training, start coaching again, even though I was the only one out of 62 graduates of my class not to take a physical therapy position out of school. And nothing to be proud of. Like, I'm not super proud of that. It was just a different, it was a different avenue that I wanted to go down. It probably wasn't the smartest thing because again, I was broke. I had some student loans. Uh, there are some different challenges economically and financially that I was going through, but I ended up moving to Southern California getting locked in with some really good people and starting my career from there, uh, making a niche in high performance athletics uh, with professional athletes, Olympic athletes right there in Southern California and really moving on from there. Very cool. It seems like, uh, you know, you, you sort of started off with this specific path and it kind of went in, in a very, very opposite direction. Um, how much of that do you think was planned, dumb luck, um, by fate? Like, how do you think that all went together? Did you did you sort of have an idea of what direction you wanted to go in? Or is it just sort of something that kind of evolved based off of the people that you tried to surround yourself with? This is a really good story. So second year of doctorate of physical therapy program, I was spending my summer in an inpatient residency uh, at the hospital locally. And I was walking people with total knees and total hips around for the first time. So like I got really good at standing people up, hoping that they didn't shit their pants and get them on my new Nikes and then sitting them back down and doing a ton of paperwork. And I remember being at lunch with like my, uh, my director who I was working under at that time. And I was doing a good job. Like I was having fun with it. I was trying to you know, make people happy around me and be a good guy. But he was just kind of like, yeah, I think, I think your mind is on sports performance. I think your mind is on training because I'd be reading all the articles. I'd be reading the journals at lunch. And all of a sudden he's like, man, you should go down and chase that. You should chase the next opportunity, try to get somewhere where you want to work for the rest of your life. And that afternoon, I ended up sending out 60 emails to every strength and conditioning coach that I highly respected. A lot of people that we all know in our circles today, I won't name names, but I ended up getting two emails back from 60 reach outs. And these weren't bullshit reach outs like, yo, I'm John, I want a job. Mm -hmm. They were cover letters, they were resumes you know, personal anecdotes on how they uh, influenced me in my career and also in what I wanted to do. And I ended up getting an opportunity out of one out of those two that ended up emailing me back. So is it fate or did I chase it down and hustle it down? It's probably a combination of both. But once you step into an opportunity, I think it's just up to you. It's up to you to work hard. It's up to you to do the right things, even when people may not necessarily be appreciating them at that time. And it's up to you ultimately to build a huge amount of rapport and create results for that athlete or that client in front of you. And you know, getting an opportunity is one thing, delivering and then continuing to deliver and then over deliver and fine tune your craft, that's a whole different thing. And that took a couple of years to do, but 
I think that once you step into the right place, it may be there, it may not be there, but you can create your own success if you just have a little bit of something behind your purpose, your why, but also being prepared with a skill set that can deliver the results repeatedly. Wow. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think the big, the big sort of takeaway for for our listeners here is, um, you know, there is such thing as luck, but hard work and and having an outstanding work ethic creates your luck, right? It, and and I wouldn't even call it luck. I would just say you you definitely enjoy the fruits of your labor because, like you said, you sent out sixty. Like that had to have taken a long time, and you got one Forever. reply. That that would never happen to, in today's day and age. It just that you don't hear stuff like that anymore. So, but I mean, I'm just uh, you know, I kind of think of uh, you know, how I came up in, in my opportunities, and it's, it's it's kind of very similar. You try to surround yourself with the right people, and when you do have that opportunity, you try to make the best of it. It, it was yeah. interesting too because I was I was out in Southern California. I'm from Buffalo, New York. I went to school in Buffalo, New York. I spent my first 23 years of my life in Buffalo. And I went out to somewhere that was totally different, but I knew that there would be opportunities out there. And uh, just seeing my dad and the way that he was able to go to conferences and be able to network with different athletic directors from all across the country, uh, there was a cool factor, or there was a, an opportunity factor that was in Southern California. But that's coming from like, you know, some guy that's basically living in Canada that doesn't know shit about shit. But going out there, it was like the, uh, the meetings of the Mecca. And there were some different things happening out there that opened my eyes up to maybe the possibilities of what may be possible in my career and really in my vocation, because I was super interested and not interested in doing anything other than that. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I drove out and I drove out with my dad. Uh, I had some beat up a Nissan Xterra that I drove out there. It was uh, 30 something hours. It was the longest drive ever. And I didn't have enough money to get an apartment or anything like that. So I checked into a day's in. So it was day by day. It was the cheapest rate ever. It was in a really bad spot in San Diego. And he just dropped me off there. He's like, all right, man, uh, good luck. Work hard. And that's it. And then he flew out and I was just there at a day's in cooking on a George Foreman grill, getting at the gym 4 a.m. every day, leaving at 9 p.m. Uh, going in on Saturdays and Sundays and just hoping and praying that I could sustain something or just create enough of an opportunity so I could maybe pay the next couple days rent at the day's in and then get a client or two from there. But it, it all turned uh, one day. I was probably there for a couple months at this point. I was training. Um, you know, general fitness population, uh, which is my specialty now, but it wasn't back then. It wasn't my want. And um, Mark Pryor, who was an awesome pitcher back in the day, Mark Pryor, he's runner up for the Cy Young two years in a row, like for the Cubs. He was the man. And he was training at our facility. And his personal trainer was sick that day at like a 5 a.m. session. And I was working out personally four to 5 a.m. every single day before I'd take my 5 uh, a.m. session. And Mark's trainer wasn't there. And he saw me working out alongside of him for a couple months at a time. And all he knew was I was kind of in shape. I seemed to know what I was doing training myself. And I played baseball at a decently high level. And he said, hey, can you train me today? Oh, yeah, I can do that. And that was the one foot in the door to really getting a Rolodex of really high-end clientele from a word of mouth referral. But again, you know, you just think about, is it fate or is it opportunity or is it a combination of both? Something like that. I look back on that. If, if that wouldn't have happened, if that trainer wouldn't have been sick that morning, I honestly don't know if I'd be here on this podcast with you guys talking about training today. So it's, it's weird how the world works sometimes. But again, you got to be prepared for those opportunities. But you also have to hold yourself to a, a high standard, even if it's you training yourself in the gym. It's funny, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Your story reminds me of when I started off, you know, as a trainer and worked at a big box gym. And we had one of those little, you know, cardboard boxes in the, in the front on the front desk where you fill it out, enter to win a free training session. And I'd get there every morning at, at five when we opened up and I'd empty them out and I couldn't wait till nine o'clock to call everybody say, congratulations, you won. <laughs> and it all trained with me and the whole the rest of the training staff hated me because they're like oh you take all the leads i said tell you what meet me here at five and i'll split them with you but don't roll in at nine o'clock like most of them did and hang out at the juice bar right and expect me to hand over all the leads and then i would 
you know, and so that's a lot of things that for, you know, this is an awesome story for a young trainer out there who's listening to this to say, like, you're not seeing the scars that, that we kind of developed over those years of like, I train the sales guys for free. So they would give me the leads because you would get two free sessions with your, your, your package. Cause I want to train anybody and everybody who would listen to me. Right. Until eventually people paid me for it. So I, I think that's, a, that's a powerful thing for people to hear that, you know, they, they do the math, say, Oh, $7,500 an hour. If I do 40 hours a week, I'm going to retire by the time I'm 50. It doesn't work that way. It, it doesn't. And today's an interesting time too. You know, we're in that tail end of 2022 here. We just got our balls kicked in for the last three years with COVID. And what is new is old is new again. And all those things that worked five years ago, 10 years ago, it's almost like they've been forgotten of because 50% of the fitness industry is churned over and we have green brand new people that have never known what it takes in order to not only be successful, to put to sustain success in this industry. And it's not the seven figure business coaches on Instagram. It's not the get rich quick models. It's the simple things done extraordinarily well consistently that will compound into high level success if you're patient and persistent enough to do so. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Are you saying those 12 friend requests I got today from some 20 <laughs> something that said he can get me a seven figure business in 48 days? That's not going to work? It's not going to work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He'll make a lot of money. You just won't. <laughs> So, um, so, so I'll oh, go ahead, Eric. No, no. Okay. It's your turn. So, so, you know, the fitness industry and who is entering gyms these days, it's changed quite a bit. It was, you know, back when I started, I remember I had a membership at this old world gym and it was a bunch of kind of meatheads, but now we're seeing more women. We're seeing more people in their forties and their fifties and beyond. Uh, what do you think is the key to tap into this sort of newer audience of people looking to move better, feel better and perform better? Oh, this is a loaded question. Um, very fortunate to have some cool data to share on this podcast with the trajectory of fitness, especially in general fitness in the commercial gym setting, especially here in America. Um, PPSC is fortunate enough to partner with Lifetime, with Equinox, with Good Life Up in Canada, and almost every other gym train uh, in the country, if not the world. So we get access to a lot of this data. Post-COVID is an interesting landscape. We are seeing anywhere from about 12 to 15% increases in membership. And a vast majority of those new increases in memberships are coming from people that are entering the gym space for the first time ever. Of that, we have a majority that are female clientele, and we also have a majority that are over the age of 50. But this is what's really interesting to me, especially for somebody who knows that stepping in the door is not necessarily going to get you the health and performance results that you're after. You actually need to train intelligently, train consistently, and compound your results, is that personal training at some of the best commercial centers in the country are down almost 40% they can barely hire personal trainers because there are that few in the country today. Pre-COVID, strength and conditioning coaches and personal trainers were about 220,000 here in America. When we look at data from about six months ago, re-emerging into the post-COVID era, we're hovering around 100,000 fitness professionals today. So what does that mean to people like us? What does that mean to our potential clientele? It means that the ones that survived are going to have a big opportunity, but also we need to take into account that people that are re-emerging into the gym in terms of membership are not necessarily ready to jump on a $150 a session package three times a week for the next three months. They are barely able to step into the gym to take action themselves that first step, meaning that we have a lot of members, we have not so much personal training, and we have a very low number of personal trainers. But I believe that the biggest opportunity today is what we call the forever client. The forever client is somebody that has pain, has injuries, may have a medical history that would have you turning up your eyebrows at, but also knows that this is their time to save their own life. Literally, not trying to be figurative with this thing. Literally, people are in the gym for the first time ever because they know that their life is on the line. 
that is going to make up a vast majority of the leads, a vast majority of your opportunities as a personal trainer or coach today. It's going to be your 59-year-old new grandmother has four adult kids, and she's looking to sustain a lifestyle so she can see those grandkids grow up. That's not the sexiest of client, I hate to say, especially for the Instagram age personal trainer. This is the vast majority of opportunities out there, but it tends to be with the very superficial in terms of knowledge, expertise trainer out there that they don't think that they're worthy. The client is worthy of training with them. You know, it's not Instagrammable, which is a very, very tough thing to be able to deal with in terms of making your decisions on your client list. But that will pose the greatest opportunity twofold because they are in dire need. They are in vital need of your services, one. But two, this demographic, this client avatar, the forever client also has a little bit more of uh, income that they can invest in their own health and wellness with. You know, simply put, it's really tough to sell something to somebody that cannot afford anything. But people need to be able to afford it, but they also need to be able to value it. Many times, the way that they value it is having some sort of life-altering moment that has an aha where they need to make some changes with. But that's the future of the fitness industry today. But it's a problem today because we have more immature, inexperienced trainers than ever before that don't realize what an immense responsibility it is for a personal trainer or coach to take on this type of client avatar, to deliver for them and create life-changing results. It's a... Uh, it's an interesting time. It is an interesting time and we definitely don't have all the answers, but every day our team sits around and we look at each other and we're like, man, this is crazy. This is crazy what happened last week, let alone last month. But the opportunities are there, but they're there for mature professional trainers, professional coaches, people that are doing things for more than themselves, a vocational trainer, I call them. You know, I, I love the way you're coming at that. And it reminds me there's there's a, a portion in our course where I talk about this, this crazy crossroads that we're at, where we're at this crossroads between what I call fragile and broken, right? And so you have these people who are coming in and maybe they have a, a shoulder, back, you know, hip, knee, whatever. And they're halfway, they're either one of the two. They're either fragile because what have they done? They've they sat at a dining room table as their workstation for the last two years, right? And they don't move except for maybe getting DoorDash. And, and so they become fragile. They become this very docile type of organism that can't handle any level of stressors. Like if it's not, you know, carpeted in 72 degrees indoors, they, they can't handle that. And then on the opposite end, the other thing that's unique that, that I've seen in the, in the 20 plus years that I've done it, when I opened up, you know, my facility in 2002, you didn't have, you know, people doing, you know, especially people in the forties and fifties, like I see now doing triathlons and doing tough mutters and doing, you know, uh, all these different extreme type of activities where these people, you know, they're the same people who are sitting at the dining room table with the laptop, but they're doing these extreme things. And now they're broken because of it. Now they both come in and they, they come in to train with you, John, and they both say my shoulder hurts but they both are coming from very different places and they both need to go back to very different places, right? So talk about how you kind of, you, you, as that trainer, how do I manage that world, right? We live in a world of extreme outliers today. And that's the reality of things. We like to think that we're fitter and sexier and more awesome than ever before because we see it in front of our face every single day scrolling the feed. But the reality is less than 5% of the American population is lifting weights, period. Like, holy shit, less than 20% are exercising. Oh, 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 okay. Um, it's not just Instagram. Instagram's not reality. The world is reality. But taking these people into account, you have the extremes. And I think that COVID did nothing good to helping with these extremes. You have the people that are like, gung-ho, no matter what, I am protecting my own health by deadlifting my PR today. I'm going to run a fucking marathon this weekend. And then you have the other people that are just like, hey, I'm just going to wait this thing out. Three years later, I'm just going to still be on the couch. And when, when I feel good enough to get off the couch another five years, then I'm going to do it. But 
we look at our specialty, which is injury prevention or injury risk mitigation, uh, more specifically said, a shoulder's not a shoulder, a back's not a back. Humans are humans and individuals have personal individual needs. And this has always been, but somehow, some way we think that we can simply classify somebody by their pain point or by their perceived dysfunction or their perceived challenge. And that just can't be. In the days of the cookie cutter, throw this at a shoulder pain patient or client, throw this at a lower back pain, the protocols, I, I see that it's not there today. Um, it's just not. Individuality is extraordinarily important, but we tend not to know as much about our clients today as we did back in the day. And that's also a problem as well. But I think the one of the biggest reasons why we're dealing with this uh, yin and yang problem between extreme fitness fanatics and extreme sedentary living is that we think that it's too complicated, it's too intense, it's too hard to make a change either way. Hey, I'm gonna take this Ironman stud and I'm gonna back him down. Well, that's gonna be hard for him to mentally and physically deal with. I'm also gonna take this person that has been sedentary getting sub 2000 steps per day for the last 25 years. And I'm gonna get them into a warm up protocol, a couple corrective exercises, get them on the bike and moving without them dying. Those are two extraordinarily challenging points. But today people, need different things than what they necessarily want. And the reason that we see such injury rates, burnout rates, and overall just mental quitting is that people are mismatched with a doable challenge in front of them that can be achieved that day in order to create some sort of viable momentum that can move them forward. We see the two ends of this extreme. We see that somebody that is already an extreme exerciser or has a training background that is pretty extensive backing down and they quit because they need the volume. Uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a client right now. She has a master's degree in exercise physiology, unbelievably smart coach. But for herself, she's trying to pump her arms every day because she likes the look of pumped biceps and triceps and she's burning out at her elbows and shoulders. Yeah, that's one extreme. To the other extreme, I have a client that is a PhD, been sitting in front of the computer, sub 2,500 steps for the last 30 years. And just to get her up and walking consistently four plus days per week is very tough physically, not mentally, but physically, having to key in and move her up little by little in a walking periodized scheme, which would have, I would have never thought would come out of my mouth uh, 10 years ago when we were talking. But these are challenges that are really tough. And I think the, the influence of social media, the influence of non-reality in what health, fitness, and wellness looks like or feels like or functions like, it really messes with people's minds and it pigeonholes even their best, most concerned efforts, sometimes even before they get started. But this is a tough role today where we need to give them what they want, also what they need, but progress them or regress them in such a way that we can get more than six weeks out of them. Because currently six and a half weeks is the average pain or burnout rate for commercial fitness here in America for 50% of clients coming into a fitness scenario for the first time. One out of every two new personal training clients will quit due to pain, injury, or just mental fortitude problems 50% of the time. It's crazy. So we got to do better than that, especially for people that are walking in and actually hiring us for our services. We have to be able to deliver for people that are actually wanting to put in the effort. Yeah, yeah I know, Mike, you want to get into the health stuff, but I want to just touch on the, the mental piece and circle back with that because there's there's also the, that challenge where you have the, the on one end, you know, my brother, who's a, who's a DPT as well, we actually had him on the show talking about research because he just got his PhD uh, as well. And, and he talked about uh, some of the most impactful research he's ever shared with me was that one of the number one um, reasons for poor outcomes in physical therapy was fear and avoidance of movement is now you, it perpetuates itself, right? That, that person who's been taking, you know, 500 steps a day at best is scared to move 
right? And how do we drop that fear? That's that's one end and keep talking about these, these polar opposites. And the other side is almost more dangerous is what I call the Al Bundy guy, right? The Al Bundy guy who, who's 45, 50 years old, who scored the four touchdowns in the state championship game and thinks he's just going to start back up after not touching a weight in 10 years and is going to do the high school workout he used to do and just put plates on the bar and go. And he's almost more dangerous. So like how we manage the mental aspect of that, I'm glad you touched on that and kind of, I think we can go down a long road with that as well. All right. So let's unpack this a little bit because in my personal opinion, we are at risk of losing uh, credibility with our profession, to be quite honest here. With uh, It's a tiny little niche in the industry today, but it has a pretty loud mouth on it, which is the fear avoidance of movement for everyone, no matter what. Just fucking do it. Your back is killing you. You have herniated discs deadlift with the barbell off the ground because, you know, you'll just get stronger and you'll get more mentally resilient that way. You know, your shoulder can't move. you got frozen shoulder. Yeah, just barbell bench press that day. It'll get better. And it's this pain science that is an illy perceived source of pain science that is really drawing to a lot of weird and interesting areas of the fitness and health industries. And I don't get a whole lot of like the haters or the trolls online, but every once in a while, I'll be like deadlifting from like a two inch block with a barbell and somebody will be like, why don't you just deadlift from the ground? Uh, well, I don't know, because my anthropometrics don't say that I can get to the bar this day and I'm not feeling good, blah, blah, blah. No, that's just bullshit. You know, it's just not a real deadlift. Then. It I call doesn't it count. The, the fitness wokeness, fitness wokeness. I am me. And I am the best. I am great. I am great because I am me and I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want because I'm me and that's the right way to do it. It doesn't matter if it defies biomechanical principles. It doesn't matter if it has weird, interesting neurological pain sourcing. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, period. Cool. For some people that can work. For other people, that is going to be a recipe for disaster. All three of us on this podcast right now we get paid to work with clients to solve their problems. I know for me with my clients, if they came into me with a problem and I just said, do it, they'd fire me because that is not a tangible way. It's not an effective way to help them from a biopsychosocial physical standpoint of helping them live longer, be more resilient, and essentially just move, feel, and function better. I, I get confused at these talking points of the movement no matter what. And I always get a lot of hate for saying this, but sometimes you need to move well before you move often. Oh, you guys have heard that one before. Sometimes you have to earn the right to do hard things in terms of loading or in terms of a skill set of some sort of movement or exercise. It is a smart, scalable progression plan that is the backbone of what we do as coaches and as professionals. When did this stop? What's old is new again, because wow, um, things that I thought of 20 years ago are coming in like brand new today, especially with some of the, some of the interesting mindsets coming out of uh, some niches in the industry. Well, it's funny, you know, I think, I think in a way social media has absolutely uh, made the fitness industry an absolute joke, but, and there's other people like yourself who is, is constantly putting out quality information. And, you know, a lot of what you're preaching is the health benefits of moving well and, and, you know, picking the right exercises. And it's not necessarily about looking, you know, the part always trying to have that six pack abs or, you know, getting your bench press up. And um, do you think as coaches, we have a limited view on our capabilities and our ability to make impact on others? As coaches, we are the front lines of proactive, preventative health care. And it's not health care as one word. It's health space care, meaning that we're doing things that hopefully can better people's lives. The reason being is that we have the most contact time with our clients compared to a professional like a physical therapist or even a physician. And we have the most impactful and empowering communication patterns in session because what we're doing with them is going to be more holistic than a specialist seeing them for a perceived problem. 
So we have the ability to touch upon lifestyle factors. We have the ability to get them stronger, leaner, more resilient, fine tune their nutrition, their sleep cycles, their stress mitigation techniques. We have the ability to better people's lives in a subclinical setting more than any other professional, professional in the he allied health and fitness space. And that's something that we shouldn't take for granted because Mike, as you just said, social media has made being a personal trainer or a strength coach almost a joke. And there's times and places I am, I am very prideful of calling myself a fitness professional and specializing in general fitness today. But there's times and places where it's hard. It's hard to see what a majority of the industry is being perceived as. Because you and I and Eric both all know that there are good coaches out there. There's great trainers out there doing things to better health and humanity. That's the reason why we do what we do. But the ones that get the most attention, the ones that are the most polarizing are the things that we stand against adamantly. Like we adamantly stand against. Uh, my team was just looking at Elon Musk's response to why he's looking better. Uh, it's due to a pharmaceutical agent that I'm in ingesting and I'm fasting. <laughs> oh, uh, we're not doing any lifestyle changes. We're not not exercising, eating better. You're just taking a pill and not eating for 16 hours. Those are the things that get the most attention. And I think they are impactful in a negative way as opposed to a positive way on the way that somebody may think that they need to better their lives or an agent to better their lives. It's a tough one today because we are swimming upstream consistently. I hate to bring up COVID again because I've already brought it up twice, but I do believe that we we got we got dissed a little bit. You know, we got thrown to the wolves a little bit to say that hey, you don't matter as a profession in this whole grand scheme of things in terms of health, holistic health, exercise, diet, lifestyle. No, no, no. Like what you do doesn't matter. That was my big takeaway generally from the entire world's response to the way that we handled things in terms of trying to live a healthier life so we can continue to live a healthier life. And that's something that will stay with me for the rest of my career. I know, I know it will. And I know it will for many of our coaches in our community is that, hey, <laughs> you said that we don't matter. You said that you know it's trivial to go in and exercise. It's just for vanity or it's just to get big biceps, or it's just a bench big or something like that. No, we're in it for a different reason. We're in it to serve the people that we work with. We're in it not for ourselves, but for others. It is a very service-based profession. And I know that that lit my fire during COVID more than anything. And it lights my fire today. And it's a big reason that we push forward so hard with the pain-free performance specialist certification. And we get out there with every opportunity that we possibly can because what we do matters. What we devoted our lives to, it matters. And we have decades of track records of results showing that it matters. We have testimonials. We have people that are living that shouldn't be living. We have people that are living a lifestyle that they could have never imagined because of us. How does that not matter? And man, I just get, I get lit up even talking about it. But I mean, that's our why of why we're doing this. When it comes to health, health comes first. Even if you're a performance athlete, even if you made $30 million a year, health comes first because your availability is your biggest ability and your most important ability, but also your ability to do it year after year, hopefully for a lifetime, whether you're playing sports or not, your life still matters. You know, I'm sure there's some young trainers out there thinking shit like oh, I just wanted to make $75 an hour to show exercises because I like <laughs> being in the gym and this is way too much, but I'm, I'm loving the grandiose vision. My, my challenge is John. And, and is that when you, you talk about fixing things upstream, like I love the book, Dan Heath's book upstream, like how do we fix these things before, like by the time they get to, why do we have to wait till they're the, the 58 year old woman with the bad back before we have to make that pivot. And I think that needs to start with how we address kids 
And, you know, we've had uh, some really great guests on talking about the broken youth sports model from Lee Taft to, to Greg Rose and, and people like that. And, but I think there's a, a bigger element beyond sports because that's a whole nother problem is that, like you said, it's, it's the kids who are not playing sports, the kids in PE that we miss because we make PE about sports. Like we, if we're going to make this fundamental change from a cultural sp- perspective, Mike, what's, what's some of your ideas of how we do that, starting with kids so they don't have to wait to be broken to get fixed? You mentioned two of my favorites. Uh, Lee, Lee's my guy. Uh, I have a seven-year-old son who loves basketball. All this kid does is shoot hoops, whether it's indoor or outdoor. He absolutely loves it. And me as a father uh, know that we need to do a bunch of different stuff and we need to keep focused on development and just being a healthy human. But man. It, it is tough because I would argue that, okay, the future is the kids. The future is the kids. Yeah, we know that. They're our future. But who lives with the kids? Who's feeding the kids? Who's driving the kids to activities? Who's teaching the kids in a PE class that's teaching them the rules of hockey as opposed to maybe jogging and playing a more physically active game? The influences are still on the backs of the adults. The responsibility is still on the back of adults. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up this statistic, uh, so don't quote me on this one, but it's going to be very, very close. But obesity, in terms of obesity rates, if you have two parents who are classified as obese, yes, BMI, yeah, we can bitch about BMI, but it is BMI with the study, 80% chance that that child will also be obese. Let me repeat that. Two obese parents leads to 80% obesity rates in their children. And of that 80%, will be obese for the rest of their lives. One obese parent in the household leads to 50% obesity risk for the child. Yeah, the future is the kids, but man, you better take care of the family household as a whole unit if you have any chance of influencing those kids' lifestyles. And it is a massive problem. We're not just talking about obesity, but obesity is in our profession, one of the biggest risks to our clients, to our communities, to our entire American culture. And it is being normalized more and more than ever before, even if there are repercussions to people's short and long-term health. But in terms of our roles, we need to throw the kitchen sink at it because I don't know if you guys have seen that trajectory of the obesity rates here in America, but I would call it a damn victory if at 2030, we didn't have any increase. We were just right where we're at, which is really piss poor. I would call that a victory for us because what are we looking at if that isn't the case? We're looking at close to 90% overweight or obese in the next 10 years. That's gonna be tough. But going back to what Mike was asking about, you know, the future of fitness and the opportunities for trainers, you better know what the hell you're doing in terms of being able to screen for medical problems, being able to screen for potential movement restrictions uh, via adipose, and be able to holistically manage a client that you know losing body fat may be the number one predictive factor for them having long-term results in their health, their wellness, and ultimately their lifestyle's performance. This is gonna be big, but health happens generationally. This is a conversation I have almost every single day is that we need to be able to dive deep in on the adults. We need to be able to influence young parents specifically so they can have the most amount of contact time in years to positively influence their children. This is where, in my opinion, the opportunity lies for us as health professionals. And it doesn't only happen in the gym. It's not just happening in personal training sessions. Uh, I've been consulting with uh, Anytime Fitness of Southern Wisconsin, which is the most successful Anytime Fitness chain in the world. 40 plus locations, tens of thousands of clients all over my region, which is Madison, Wisconsin area. And I love going in. I've been training there for eight weeks to kind of check everything out, you know, use the equipment, get into the culture. I love the group training. I love the team training. I love seeing the diversity of people that are going in and utilizing these sessions. I love what the trainers are talking about. I love the follow-ups that happen with nutrition. 
and I love more than anything that is happening at a large scale. Us three, we can get results with anyone that you put in front of us, but not everyone's gonna be a Mike Perry or Eric Degatti. We need to be able to somehow get a blueprint set that can help as many people as possible, as deeply as possible. It needs to happen on scale if we have any hope of trying to reverse the preventable disease epidemic that we're currently in. And it's gonna take everything. It's gonna take everyone. And it's going to be the fight of our lifetime in terms of our vocational practice. At the end of our careers, if we can look back and say that, hey, we help the health of our community, more specifically our community, because that's where we can touch, then that's something that we can hang our hats on and feel good about. One by one, it creates momentum, but we need to be talking hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people in order to start reversing some of these really alarming pre preventative health metrics that we're seeing moving in the opposite direction. All right. So I'm glad I recycled this one, Perry, is I'm bringing this question. I'm going a little Tim Ferriss and I, I'm, I'm starting to have a recurring question that I like to ask people. So I came up with a, a fictitious title. Maybe we can make it real and, and we can vote for it. But if they had a czar of exercise that was that was the worldwide, you can implement laws and standards for globally for the fitness industry. And I, you just got elected, John. What's what's some of the first things you implement in, pol in terms of policy? <laughs> oh man, you know, you, you start dictating uh, exercise on people, it's going to be some uproars happening across the country, but it doesn't have to be exercise. I always look at our biggest opportunity in terms of trying to prioritize what can move the needle the most. First and foremost, it's always going to be mental health. Mental health, people being mentally healthy and happy so they can unlock their potential is always going to be number one. And even for people that exercise, even for people that have a dialed in diet, if they're struggling here, they're struggling here, it's gonna to be tough for them to not only get a result, but sustain it for a lifetime because there's a lot that goes into being able to live out your life at a high performance level. So that's number one. We need to get our minds right. And it's a tough one today because we're behind the eight ball again. You know, I won't bore you with the statistics, but whoa, they're alarming. Second to that, it's not only about exercise. Our non-exercise movement in this country is horrible. Horrible levels of non-movement based uh, or non-exercise based movement. Moving throughout the day, you know, <laughs> We, we started to debunk the 10,000 steps per day. I don't know anyone who ever got worse from getting more steps per day in. So being able to get up and move and be somewhat active throughout a day, every single waking hour, just being able to stand and take a couple steps, you know, that's the bare minimum. And it's very accessible for people as well. You look at the most common physical activity in the world today, it's standing up and walking on your two feet. That can still potentiate further steps forward in this paradigm and this but one second john this is where one of those areas when we go back to before where we shoot ourselves in the foot as an industry when if you go on twitter and there's strength coaches arguing if walking counts did you catch that i don't know if you caught that <laughs> argument but does walking count as real exercise like because it doesn't show up on their heart rate monitor or it doesn't show up on their you know it, it, you can't come up with a uh, um a scale of what percentage of intensity it is it doesn't count as exercise but that's what scares people away and makes people think we're idiots yeah i look at something like a walking practice uh, i have multiple clients that i'm working with right now we have implemented them in from a couch to a walking practice. Is that exercise? No, it's not exercise. It's not. It doesn't have any stimulus that can be progressed, except for progressive overload, take more steps forever. But not everything has to be exercise. You know, in the perfect scenario, we have this combination between structured exercise and non-exercise based daily movement. And it's this ebb and flow of two different aspects of long-term health and longevity that need to be addressed if we're gonna have the best results possible. But I also look at something like a walking practice as being a potentiating factor for maybe being more likely to move into a more structured exercise or training-based scenario. We've seen that. Somebody going from the couch to uh, you know getting crushed with kettlebells is probably not a good trajectory. We jumped the flight of stairs there. 
But just having the ability to create some sort of base, non-exercise based movement, that can move the needle forward for a lot of people. And everyone always points at like Europe and they'll point at Asia. Oh, they're walking so much, therefore they're thin. There's a lot of other factors that go into that. But there's some truth to that. If we move more, that is a big part of the equation. But we need to be able to eat properly, eat responsibly. I call it eating like a responsible adult. That needs to happen as well, because as we know, even our best, most ruthless exercise endeavors or movements throughout the day can be absolutely nullified in one meal a day. So we need a better organization of how we prioritize what we fuel our body with, have a better relationship and appreciation for food and our ability to utilize it, not as a drug, but as a source of, uh, of living and trying to push all of this stuff into uh, a really holistic based model. I know it sounds like fluffy, but holistic health is definitely my focus the last number of years because that's where I see that we can get the best, most sustainable life-changing results. We can get results with somebody in three months. You know, we can get somebody jacked or lose weight or whatever, but I'm, I'm not interested in doing anything that's not sustainable at this point in my career. My client comes to me with unsustainable goals in a time frame. I'm just not the coach for you. I you go work with somebody else because I am not willing to jeopardize your health and your future for something that may be a goal set of yours that may be a little bit more superficial or too quick on the punch. And that's just me, but I look at it as trying to set the tone of how we wanna live forever. When somebody hires me as their coach, I not only wanna coach them, but I wanna mentor them so they can go on and they can sustain this for life. Give them the tool sets, give them the abilities to problem solve and ultimately empower them showing them that they are in charge of their own life. They're in charge of their movement. They're in charge of what goes into their mouth. They're in charge of their relationships. They're in charge of their sleep. And taking self-responsibility more than anything else, it's hard to get somebody to take it. You can't force self-responsibility upon somebody, but if it can click for them with your facilitation, that is when we start really seeing notable changes in the way that somebody can live for themselves and the way that they live for themselves so they can influence their friends, their families, their communities, their workplace, and ultimately, again, grassroots it a little bit. It sounds cliche, but it does start with one person. One person can influence a household. One person's household can influence an entire community. I see it every single day. And it's a powerful thing that we shouldn't take for granted. Every word matters, every interaction matters. And we can always do our best in order to try to facilitate positivity and empowerment with the way that people can ultimately make a change in their life that can help them. You, you hit know? a lot of, you hit, oh, I'm sorry, ahead, Mike. Bud. you hit a lot of points only because I, I think of it because I just finished this book called Ikigai. And ikigai is a Japanese word meaning for life's purpose. And the, the, the book uh, looks into what they call blue zones, where they have these outliers and abnormal high concentration of octogenarians and people living past 100 and living, not, not just having longer lifespans, but greater health spans, like being robust in, in doing the things that they're doing into their 90s and, and beyond. And some of those main factors that they looked at were we're moving, but not necessarily, like you said, exercise moving, but when they do do something, it's purposeful with, with a breath practice in, incorporated with it. So they looked at Okinawa, actually, in this one specific area uh, in Japan had the highest concentration and they do Tai Chi, they do Qigong, they do yoga as their exercise, but they're constantly walking, they're gardening, but more importantly, they have a sense of community. They have, um, they have a purpose, whether it's gardening or something to that effect, or a lot of them work right up until the day that they die. They talked about their diet, obviously was important. And then that mental aspect of, of being able to slow down and manage things and knowing they had support systems around them is pretty much everything that you're talking about, which created a robust, resilient, sustainable uh, lifestyle that, that keeps you going, right? So um, it, it's just interesting to see that, that you're taking that and, and implementing it with the people that you're coaching and teaching every day, which is awesome. So Mike, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. I was just going to say, you know, uh, one thing that, that John had mentioned was mental health. And then we talked about basically like getting your steps and, you know, here's the reality of it. 
um, you know, barring any giant orthopedic issues, you know, going out for a walk and taking a few minutes to just breathe and refocus and slow down, it can really accomplish those two things at once, right? Not too many people are going to go for a walk and be like, that. I feel like shit. Like they're always going to be, I mean, listen, I'm not a walking guy. Right. But when I do actually, you know, go for an, uh, an intentional walk by myself, I always feel a ton better, but I get about like 20 to 25,000 steps inside my gym. But my wife, you know, she goes out every day and she makes time to, to walk twice a day and it's only 10 to 15 minutes. And she always comes back. She feels better. She's more focused. She's more patient with me. Cause uh, I'm, I'm a giant pain in the ass. She's more, you know, she's more um, patient with the kiddos. So it's really a twofer, right? It's really an opportunity to get that sort of um, that non-exercise based sort of uh, accumulation of steps. But at the same time, the, the mental component of just slowing down a little bit, because we, we live in a world that just absolutely hammers us with you got to go high intensity and you got to murder yourself and and we're just we're enamored by this barrage of just piss poor information that's being fed to us we have to be everybody needs to be you know trained like a navy seal or trained like a power lifter and it's like man that's the shit that we're competing with and it, and it does and you mentioned this earlier john it seems like whoever yells the loudest gets the most attention even if it's terrible information so how do we how do we overcome that how do we compete with with that with, with shirtless cavemen eating organ meat in the middle of the woods. <laughs> I think that we don't try to compete online. We don't try to compete on Instagram. We don't have our self-worth wrapped into the amount of followers and the amount of likes or shares that we get on a social media feed that we get back to the basics, which is influencing our clients, our communities, our facilities, and being able to push that forward. Because the reality of... The social media age in today's fitness industry is this. I know a lot, a lot of million follower fitness professionals out there that don't have two pennies to rub together. Oh, it's a loud voice, but that voice is being loud against 50, 100, 200 other loud voices that are counteracting them. I know a lot of people that you've never heard of that are absolutely killing it with their clients. They have a beautiful home and families and a bank account that would impress anybody, but they're not necessarily getting the amount of notoriety or the amount of attention. I would say attention is the best word for it. Attention doesn't necessarily translate into monetary income. It doesn't necessarily translate into respect. It doesn't necessarily translate into responsibility. So when we look at trying to compete in that space, nope, I'm not interested in competing in that space. Um, I'm really not. And I was a number of years ago. I wasn't changing anything that I was doing, but I was a lot more worried about it. But things have changed and it's cool. You know, if the metaverse wants to dictate that, you know, my push-up progression is a piece of shit and they're not going to show it to anyone, then cool. You know, those 30,000 people that saw it, as opposed to the 3 million that saw some other bullshit, like it, cool. They will push things forward. I think this has never been more, this has never been more apparent than the takeoff of the pain-free performance specialist certification. Like, do I have the biggest following in the world? No. Do I have the biggest website in the world? No. Like I have a significant amount of people that read and educate themselves via our content and our education systems. But when it came to actually going out and getting somebody to spend anywhere from 600 to $1,000 to sit and listen to you talk and train for an entire weekend that they had to buy a plane ticket for, that they had to have a hotel for three nights with, that's when you can really see if you're making a real influence on the industry or are you an influencer? Influence versus influencer. People will stack our courses every weekend, five courses a weekend forever because what we've done has helped them. It gained them their respect. They have some sort of knowledge base in the systems that they're coming in to learn. And ultimately they believe in what we believe, which is huge. So if you're gonna sell out, or you're gonna to attempt to sell out for following or likes, good luck, like good luck. And that's the reason that we see such transient ins and outs of personal trainers in our age today. 
you know, within three to six months, oh, I can't be making $10,000 a month on an online training, oh, I'm out. Oh, I can't get a full book of clients of all sexy models that were on the Victoria's Secret catalog, like, oh, I'm out. Yeah, when everyone else is out, it's those that actually persevere. They get through the career capital of about 10,000 hours, which equates in our industry to full-time work for about four years. If you can push through to about four years as a strength or a personal trainer, strength coach or a personal trainer, you are in the 1% because there's not many veterans out there that are doing great things. We all know them. Not everyone else does. But ultimately, you have to ask yourself the question, does that really matter? Do you want to be known for showing your oiled up abs and your girlfriend's sexy fake ass on Instagram? Or do you want to go somewhere in your own community and have a father come up to your son and say, hey, you know who, is, you know who your dad is? Your dad helped me lose 40 pounds. Your dad got me off a of blood pressure medication. Your dad is the reason that I'm here today. Like you got a choice to make. It's going to be a hard choice, but ultimately we will persevere against all the bullshit. It will continue to evolve. It will continue to change. We'll be having these same conversations, wondering which way the industry is going another 10 years from now. But providing results for people and more so creating dynamic relationships that go beyond the gym, that shit never goes out of style and you'll be in more need and you will be at a higher premium as you continue to do that year after year. So trying to compete in that space, nah, I'm not interested in it. I know you guys aren't interested in it. What we're interested in trying to make large scale impact. And it starts off small, but it does pick up steam. Like I can promise you that I'm a testament to that. Can I get an amen? I feel like we need to baptize someone right now. I mean, no, that was, that was powerful, John. And, um, you know, you can tell that you're incredibly passionate about, about what you do in the way that you approach things. Um, and it's just refreshing to hear because, um, you know, I, I followed your work for, you know, a really long time. Um, but we've never really had the opportunity to interact. And I, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's really cool just to see your authenticity come through and your passion come through because clearly, um, you know, you, you've done well for yourself, but you can tell you're, you, you're doing it the right way. You're not, um, you're not just, you know, doing all the fancy stuff just to get attention, but you are impacting others. And, and I think your story is so important because um, it's the impact that we make, right? It's, it's the, it's the legacy. That's what I always try to think about is what's my legacy going to be. Um, you know, and, and I think it's cool when we train the big names, right? We get to train all these UFC fighters and that's a lot of fun stuff. But, you know, like you said, when, you know, one of your clients comes up and you're like, Hey, I was able to pick up my grandkid for the first time without pain. Like that's the good stuff. Right. So no, we, we, man, we, we truly appreciate your authenticity and your excitement. I'm, I'm, I'm all fired up right now. I'm ready to run through a wall. I mean, <laughs> no, this is, this is good stuff. So um, Eric, uh, anything you want to add to as we get towards the end of this? Yeah. You, you started hitting on it and I said, there's, you know, there's two big things that I, that I wanted to get, you know, out of this, the taking this, what we've been doing, Mike, and doing the podcast is one is, get people that, you know, I, I respect in the industry to get on here. So it's, you know, what, what the, the average trainer sees is in, as they scroll through, they're like, Oh, that's, that's, that's John. He sells a course and, you know, he, Oh, he has some cool exercise sometimes that I'll have to click on is to kind of get this extra time to sit down and make that connection. So they could see like, this is not just somebody trying to put butts in seats at a conference room, you know, on Saturdays, this is somebody who's got a true mission right and kind of a, a purpose in what he's doing and and i think uh that really kind of show you know shown through today and i think the other thing and we had this conversation uh on the last episode with kevin carr is that because of what happened post covid right and so much of it's got wiped out i think there's also a, a void for people like yourself and what i mean by that is if you remember when, you know, and I, I'm, I'm dating back even way further than you, John, is that when I came in, you know, and I would go to a perform better or idea or one of those things. And I'd look at a, a gray cook or Mike Clark or 
or, uh, you know, Mike Boyle. And these guys are rock stars to me as a, as a hungry young trainer. And, and, you know, that generation of, of, of leaders has started to kind of move on into the sunset a little bit. And this new, this new wave of, of trainers that you're talking about, they don't have a connection with those guys. They just don't, they don't, they aren't the, the rock stars that they were to you and I. And so somebody needs to step up and fill that void and, and people like yourself and Kevin are, are doing that. And, and we, we, you know, we just hope to rub shoulders with you guys in, in that mission. So uh, we want to thank you for everything that you shared today. Uh, thank you very much. And it is, uh, it's like the pleasure of my life and it's, uh, it's an opportunity in my life to be able to take something and teach it to others. It's like, it's the coolest thing in the world. You guys know this more than anybody, but being able to share your experiences, your life and professional experiences and put your heart and your soul out on the line for 16 hours in a course. Whew, man, there's nothing more rewarding than that. It's exhausting. It's one of the hardest things that you can ever do is teaching a certification course, but it is one of the single most rewarding things that I've ever been a part of. And us being able to scale it at such a level that we've done and have world-class educators being able to have that same feeling, but over deliver for our students and our coaches coming through the cert. I, I say this every single time, but it is like, it's like pinch me. Uh, it's unbelievable to be able to have that sort of influence, but ultimately it's our best road forward to trying to make an impact on our health of our country and our community and, and the entire world in general. You all are on the same mission and that's why I appreciate you guys so much as well. So now what's, what's new and exciting? What, what can we look forward to coming out of, uh, out of your world and PPSC in the, in the, the months and weeks and, and, and years to come? So last year, uh, we were able to hit the 10,000 certified coaches, Mark, uh, and that's all in person, which was the goal of launching the certification. It's like, if we're going to do this, we're going to go big. We're going to get to 10,000, then we'll see what we do from there. Uh, currently, we're almost at about 13,000 moving into the end of the year. And next year, we are going to be launching uh, a brand new course, uh, which I will be headlining in 12 cities all across the world, which will be the Functional Strength Training Certification. And this will be the yin to the PPSC's yang. And it's something that I've like kept my mouth shut on for three and a half years while we've been running the foundation cert for the PPSC. But I'm looking forward to getting out and being able to teach again. Uh, I haven't been teaching a whole lot the last three years. Uh, we've had a staff of unbelievable experts in every single niche in the industry going out and dominating every single weekend. And I'm looking forward to getting back out there. Uh, yeah, I've been sitting at home for way too long, mm. it seems. And just getting that excitement back in, uh, getting the blood, sweat, and tears back into sessions. Uh, that's what I'm most looking forward to. And we're going to be moving into that beta testing it next month here in Madison, Wisconsin, and then moving it into 2023 alongside the base pain-free performance specialist certification. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming, but it's, it's the right time. Awesome. Good for you. And congrats on everything you've been able to accomplish uh, since that conversation a long time ago. We're <laughs> going to put up all the, all the links to everything uh, in the show notes. Perry, anything you want to add before we wrap it up? No, this was an awesome episode. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very excited for this to come out and listen to it myself because, you know, I'm sitting here and all the things that he's talking about, I just wish I could like press pause and like, you know, fill up a dry erase board mm -hmm. with all the things that I'm thinking about right now. But, um, you know, John, we appreciate you. We appreciate your passion. We appreciate you leading the industry through uh, being a great example, not only in the industry, but also, you know, with the people that you're surrounded with. So, um, you know, thank you so much. And uh, Eric, I'll let you close this out, bud. Well, all right. I, I do have one last question. John, how many times a day do you get that? Wow. You're like a younger, better looking Mike Perry. <laughs> <laughs> that's listen, you're that's profiling, fan. dude. That's total profiling. You know, <laughs> this is a choice. Okay. This is a choice. This is, this is it's aerodynamics. I'm just saying. I mean, are you wow. really a strength coach if you're not bald with a really yeah. scraggly beard, Eric? Are no, you? yeah, I am a you know total, what? You and your, I am a total piker. You and your, you know, your Italian locks over there. You know, <laughs> the the amount of product that this guy uses is ridiculous, and we won't even go down that route. But it is what it is. It does cut into the profit margins. But again, thank you, John. This has been awesome. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. We will see you on the next episode. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. 
If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.